you everybody for coming. Uh, welcome to Daylight and Electric Modeling Part 2. Uh, we're going to be getting into some more detail with some of the, the themes we explored uh, in the last section. Uh, and I'm just going to give a little opening here just so that we're all oriented uh, in terms of what the, the larger presentation is. Um, all right, so with that, last time we had kind of covered uh, the, uh, mo specifically with modeling a lot of daylight scenarios for, for uh, an office. Uh, we looked at uh, challenging a few sort of myths, as I called them, with, with daylight or understanding, I guess, the relative impact of light shelves and light diffusing materials. Uh, and skylights, etc. And now today we're going to uh, get into some of the other uses of the of the same sort of engine that we use to model daylight, uh, and we're going to be using those to model electric lighting. Um, specifically, I mean, while there are so many cases where electric lighting is is useful, we're going to be using it specifically to model uh, light pollution mitigation, uh, which is a design case that I'm pretty familiar with. And if you guys have ever applied for the LEED credit for light pollution, you'll also be familiar with. Uh, then we're going to look at another uh, use of the rendering engine that's under the hood that essentially allows us to model daylight. Um, and the very nice thing about this rendering engine is, is that it's physics-based. So it's, it's, uh, it's really the closest thing that you can ever get out of a computer to what your, what your actual materials are going to look like. And so we're going to do a case of, uh, of, you know, of actually looking what, what real glass looks like by selecting um, uh, real glass products from uh, a library from the International Glazing Database, to be specific, uh, and then we're going to do some uh, some some detailed uh, glare studies with that with those same rendering outputs. So really, I kind of cover this is the schedule for today. I mean, it's mostly going to be you know a bit of like three separate topics. I'm going to answer a few questions from the last session, go into a little bit more detail, just because I get the sense a lot of us on today might have attended the last session. So uh, just the first few minutes, I'm going to just clear up a few things that that came up with that. Um, sort of in the aftermath. And, uh, uh, and then, yeah, we're just going to do, we're not necessarily going to focus too much on one design example, but we're going we're gonna to do uh, 30 minutes of setting up the electric lighting model and evaluating it, uh, 30 minutes of physics-based rendering, and then 30 minutes of glare analysis. All right. So with that, um, I just wanted to say, kind of, oh, well, and also to sort of say where we are in terms of the whole, all of Honeybee's capabilities. Um, I mean, you, you guys probably know that we spent a good month or so covering a lot of the energy modeling stuff, but we're still, we're, we're now in the daylight modeling stuff. And this is actually going to be the last daylight tutorial of this series. Um, and uh, we specifically, well, it's actually, it's not simply just daylight, it's also electric light and glare um, that, that we're going to be covering. But uh, that's just so that you know that we're specifically using these, these capabilities. Uh, and I just wanted to take a second. I mean, I imagine actually a lot of us are experts on the uh, on listening in here, and you probably already know the what's what's kind of under the hood. But I just wanted to take a few, uh, just a couple of minutes before we dive into covering some of the stuff from, uh, or just you know starting to cover the new content, just to explain exactly what these engines are and how they work and how they help us, because they really are possibly more so than any of the other engines that we connect to. Uh, some of the most thriving open source communities are around uh, around Radiance and Dacent here. Um, and so I just want to explain just a very, very brief history, also to give kind of credit to the people who created these things, um, as they are, they are gurus and, and masters to whom we, we aspire <laughs> uh, to, to be much, well, we, uh, the Ladybug open source community very much so aspires to be uh, like these. Um, and to specifically, uh, specifically start off with, um, Whoops, sorry there. Just to make sure that everyone understands, Radiance is mostly what we've been using um, uh, for, for a lot of the exercises today. And really, just to be clear, so that everyone really understands what Radiance is, is that at its core, it is a rendering engine. So it's the same thing as V-Ray or 3D Max or all the other rendering engines that we may be familiar with. Um, uh, and we use regularly in practice. But the thing that makes Radiance so special in comparison to some of these other, uh, uh, some of the other rendering engines that we have out there is that Radiance is physics-based. And, and what that means is that it's really trying to model to the highest degree of accuracy the actual physics of light, the actual optics of the situation. Um, and also another thing that makes it very special is that it's open source and it's a powerful combination of these two things that has allowed a lot of a wide community of experts to tap into its capabilities 
uh, to validate those capabilities uh, and to apply them to all sorts of situations like those that we are uh, using here. And just to give a, a shout out, I mean, this man is very well loved in the, <laughs> in the Radiance community because he started it. Uh, it was his, Radiance was originally his, uh, his PhD thesis, I believe, his dissertation. Um, and uh, many, many oh, decades ago, I guess at this point, uh, he made he made the Radiance engine, and it was sort of the best of its time. And because of that, he's I mean, and because of his support uh, for everyone who uses his 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 tool and has built off of his tool, it's flowered into this very uh, wonderful open source community of Radiance. Uh, so that's one key. Now, that a lot of the things, all the images that you see, we're going to produce today, all the Illumina simulations we ran last time, they were all plugging directly into Radiance. Uh, now there was one other sort of uh, set of tools which uh, which we used in the last time, and if you guys remember that we um, we looked, we were able to calculate the annual percentage of daylight over over a, uh, over a spatial area, and in order to do that, in order to do a specific uh, task of calculating annual daylight, we were using uh, DaySim, which is another open source library. Uh, but it, it is essentially a set of tools and, and li a library that is built off of Radiance that allows us to easily and quickly run annual, get annual daylight metrics from Radiance. And that was the product of someone who I'm proud to say is my, was my thesis professor, Christoph Reinhardt, uh, fabulous man. Um, and uh, yeah, and he, he had worked with that in collaboration with a number of other people. Uh, I guess this was two, almost two and a half decades ago uh, to build DASIN. Uh, and that is exactly how we get those those uh, those metrics. So just to really give a shout out to these open source communities and, uh, and the people who started them, uh, that they're they're really the reason why I'm able to talk to you today. <laughs> uh, and then finally to say, because to, to give of course credit to the open source interface. Uh, to be honest, I mean I I, I have a knowledge and at least enough of the knowledge to teach these tools to you guys, but we really need to make sure that we credit uh, Mustafa was. The guy who has built the Honeybee interface that we're using today, um, in conjunction with now, especially a lot of help from Sarath uh, Subramanim. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Sarath. If uh, if you ever listen to this, <laughs> uh, but Sarath is a PhD student. He's the one who added the electric lighting capabilities that we're going to be working with today. Um, and it's also very important to say that the two of these uh, wonderful gentlemen have built. The uh, a new the API essentially off of um, uh, off of off of Radiance and DaySim uh, that now allows us to I mean well of course now I mean they originally built Mustafa originally and Sarath originally built the interface we're using today which is all within the components but uh, coming down the line these two have just finished a pretty good uh, interface and API for uh, for the next version of Honeybee which is going to be a foundation I think for a lot of um, a lot of uh, plugins into Radiance and, and Basin, uh, perhaps in the future, or at least we can say Ladybug and Honeybee for Ryan, for Grasshopper and Dynamo. Um, and uh, and just to maybe give a give a quick explanation of that, I mean this is this is that that API that they sort of put everything into a set of functions. It's all object oriented. Not to get too nerdy on everyone here and deep into code, but uh, but this is also a very very important part of um, of being able to build off of Radiance and Basin now. Um, that thanks to these two these two gentlemen, and uh, so all right. So I just wanted to say that quickly at the start, um, and uh, and make sure I also said uh, what else. That um, uh, I just wanted to give a sort of an explanation because we worked a lot with what were called uh, BSDFs or bidirectional scattering distribution functions last time, uh, and I just wanted to. I mean, this is this is pretty much the file that we used last time with a few alterations. Uh, and I just wanted to, because there were a few questions that came up, and I imagine I think a lot of people listening on this one uh, probably saw the last one. Um, so just a couple of notes, uh, because I, I noticed that some people had ran into some issues applying uh, a bidirectional scattering function or dif light diffusing material to a skylight. Uh, and the reason is, is that we didn't cover another input on this component called the up orientation. Um, and really what this, this doesn't have too much of, a, of an impact on... Um, on uh, what should I say? On on the specific material that we were what we were trying to simulate, which was an Ocalux product. But if you start modeling, let's say Venetian blinds at an angle or materials that are not symmetrical about the surface plane, uh, it's kind of important to pay attention to this because this essentially sets the orientation of that scattering material. 
Um, and, uh, and so the thing is, the reason why some people had run a skylight and not had it show up in the simulation, uh, that was only because the, the uh, vector here for up orientation uh, was, was essentially, it was uh, perpendicular, or sorry, parallel to the actual surface we were applying it to. So it was essentially saying it was, it was as if there, were, there, uh, there was no material in, this, in the simulation at all, that it was, it was all sort of parallel to the grain. Uh, so I just want to say that in the file, ARPAN is distributed, distributed to you guys in this workshop, uh, an updated version of this file, uh, just so you know, or we will distribute it, because uh, I, I think we're waiting for the last minute to see who registers. Uh, and just so you know that, uh, one, we decided to change the default on this so that it's easy, so that people don't get confused if they don't see the skylight uh, at first. So this is, this is the default, and this is now good for both skylights and, uh, and for uh, uh, typical vertical windows. Uh, and so, yeah, so you can see here that um, we're basically, yeah, we're getting a full daylight area, and, and this is what happens. We get this nice diffuse light when we apply. Uh, that scattering function to the skylight that we that we uh, uh, you know we didn't get to last time, but I know some people try to do that and want to clear that up. Uh, and the other thing is that the other thing you'll notice about the file is that um, that the, everything is built up by surface by surface uh, components. So whereas before in the last session we took a zone and added windows to it, uh, like essentially the equivalent of a thermal zone or an HP zone uh, as we call it. Um, and the thing is, really, if you're only using stuff for daylight simulation, if you don't need to get also energy use values out of it, building things up surface by surface usually allows you more control and stops you from, from messing up more easily. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that, that, that this is also a good method, probably, if we were only doing daylight as we were last time, um, that, that setting it up this way is a good idea. Um, all right. And Finally, I just wanted to confirm one other, one other thing. So this is just an aluminum simulation, which we spent most of the time working with last time. And we get out values in lux, um, you know, which is a measure of daylight. Uh, but then we also ran annual simulations to get annual daylight metrics. And we found that the, uh, the BSDF material wasn't, wasn't working. Uh, and again, I just wanted to say I confirmed with the masters, with the gurus, Mustafa and, and Sarath, that the reason is because uh, uh, is essentially because DaySim does not uh, does not have yet BSDF material support. So literally everything else that we use, Radiance has full support for it, which is why we're able to get these illuminance values with these light diffusing materials, these BSDF materials. Uh, as is Open Studio and Energy Plus, but DaySim is still working on on it. Uh, and this is a slide I pulled from a uh, presentation by uh, Andy McNeil, who's another wonderful uh, member of the the radiance and, and op many open source communities. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's the only reason why. And, and I just wanted to say also, I also confirmed with Mustafa and Sarah that uh, the newest API version of Ladybug and Honeybee, uh, this version, that it's in a beta right now, but you saw me demo it in, in Dynamo last time, and we have, we have some Grasshopper examples. But this version, uh, according to Mustafa and Sarah, they've already completed uh, essentially what is called the th a three-phase method which is going to replace our use of DASIM uh, for annual metrics. Um, and, uh, and because of that, uh, you can actually model BSDF materials uh, now for annual daylight metrics in the new beta version. So just, yeah, if you guys really need to know to have values like daylight autonomy and the things that we used last time, uh, full annual daylight metrics with BSDF materials, uh, you know that it's in the beta and you can use it at your own risk and it will be available to all of us uh, very soon. Uh, once, once we everything's out of beta, and we've uh, we've we've done a more a slightly more robust implementation of the interface. All right, so I just wanted to cover that. It took a few minutes uh, just to start to cover that, and I think now we're going to get into what actually what we're going to do today, the actual content of today. Which we're going to start off with the electric lighting, as you saw, uh, and specifically, ARPIN is going to distribute to everyone a Rhino file. Uh, that's it's a relatively generic site. There's not too much in here, but uh, but basically what we're going to be doing in the first part is that we're going to be uh, building an electric lighting model for a nighttime condition, uh, and all of these points are going to represent uh, electric lights that are being used to illuminate pathways and streets uh, around the site. Uh, and you'll see, so we've got you know basically a building that's a part of it. We've got a landscape. Uh, and importantly, I mean, because I'd like to do this in a context that I know is, will be useful to some people at least, um, is that there's a, a property line uh, drawn around the site here. And the reason why that is there is because specifically the lead credit, um, 
for uh, for light pollution mitigation uh, essentially says it's a little bit arbitrary in the sense that our, our property boundaries are sometimes a little bit arbitrary but I mean it's kind of the best that we can do right now but essentially they draw a limit of light that you can have the like the highest amount of, of, of lux or, or, or light intensity that you can have uh, and they say that you, you know you can't have that threshold more than uh, I think it's 15 feet from the edge of the of the property, uh, it's a really like strict threshold. I think it's a, it's about 0.1 lux, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it's 0.1 lux, um, and uh, and so we're going to just try and and design an exterior lighting scheme uh, that is sensitive to light pollution, and that would meet this this leap credit. All right, so to start with this, I'm going to open up Grasshopper. Now Grasshopper, whoops, Grass. There we go. Uh, oops, and it looks like it is ah, it is off my screen. I hate this because I, I I switched to a different screen. Uh, we're just gonna restart quickly, guys. Sorry, <laughs> um, but I I have to remember to do this next time. Uh, all right, I'm just gonna start Rhino again. Whoops, open new window and electric lighting model, and all right. So we're gonna just gonna open up, reopen up the site, and now I'm gonna type grasshopper, and it should come up okay. All right. So sorry, that's just because I have two screens <laughs> in my other setup. So uh, so I just had to fix, fix a few things there. All right. So let's get started. As we start with every file uh, of Ladybug and Honeybee, I'm gonna drag and drop the Ladybug, Ladybug, and drag and drop the Honeybee, Honeybee. Uh, whoops, no, it's human. There it's Honeybee. All right. All right, and so we've got our libraries loaded into memory. Uh, next thing we're going to want to do is bring in some of this geometry. Uh, now, we don't really need to bring in all of it. In particular, I'm not going to bring in this glass facade uh, just because it's a little more detailed than what we really need for a condition like this. But we're going to work with that later. Um, and I'm going to, let's see, make an empty geometry parameter. And I'm going to set the ground surface. And we're going to go set one geometry. Uh, maybe, and I'll just label this ground to be perfectly clear. All right, so we've got that. We're gonna let's bring in the buildings, at least the rough massing of the buildings. Uh, all right, I'll just select broadly our building masses there, and set multiple geometries. Um, all right, and uh, and then lastly, we need to bring in our lights. And so you see the way that the lights are organized in this file is that we have we have actually two types of fixtures here. Um, and I've, I'm doing this, it's going to take a little longer to set up, but I think it's worthwhile to at least show you how to set up a, a model with, with multiple types of lights. Uh, and so we have essentially one set of lights here, and these are actually, these are the actual position of the fixtures. And, uh, and these are going to be street lights. This is actually a street that runs next to the property here. Um, and so we've got those types of lights, and then we've got sort of normal path lights that here that are in another um, another set of points. And so we're going to take the two of these uh, together. We're going to assign two different sets of light fixtures to these uh, in order to simulate them in our in our model. Uh, and importantly, also for one of them, one of these types of light fixtures, specifically the ones on the street, uh, they have a directionality to where they point the light. So they're really meant to direct the light onto the street. And so in order to help us there, we have a few points that are going to help us aim those lights onto the street correctly. Um, and we'll, get, we'll, well, we'll understand once we get to it. But right now, I'm just going to uh, select these points. And we'll bring up Grasshopper again. And I'll bring up an empty point parameter. And we'll set multiple points. And so that'll bring, so we've got these points now in, in Rhino, sorry, in Grasshopper. Uh, and maybe we'll say, we'll call these street lights. And whoops, I got my caps lock on. All right. All right, and then we'll, we'll call the other ones, um, let's see. We'll, well, let's first bring them in. So we've got these other lights here. So I'm going to select these, these other lights, and we're going to right-click and set multiple points. And we'll call these uh, path lights. All right, so maybe we'll start with the path lights because actually I know because we'll introduce the aiming points separately. So and I'll turn the preview off here. So all right, so you notice that all we really need to define electric lights um, 
in, in in Honeybee is a set of points essentially. Well, that's the only rather sorry. It's the only geometric input that we need, uh, other than the context around these lights. Um, and specifically, we're going to well. All right, actually, let's take care of the context first, actually, before we get into the lights. So you guys remember from last time, we just passed each of these components through a create HP surfs component. This assigns a whole bunch of daylight properties, like a whole set of materials to them. Um, and whoops, not the path lights. It's not what I meant to connect up there. I meant to connect up the ground. And, um, and maybe, you know, we'll just assign some, we have a library of radiance materials, albeit a, a relatively small library. Uh, in in Honeybee, which you can add to uh, fairly easily, but we'll see that we're just going to take uh, I'm just going to take our default sort of generic context material and use that for the ground. So context material, hit enter. All right, and that's going to go up to our rad material there, and the buildings will take whatever is assigned by default, which should be a bunch of exterior floors and roofs. Uh, you know, whatever the normals of the surfaces are actually going to auto-assign uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of materials to that for radiance. All right, so we've got, I'll group that all together. We've got our geometry ready to go with some materials. All right, now to define the path lights. So in order to do this, you guys will notice that, I'm going to make Grasshopper big here, our two tab, uh, which used to just be called Sky, sky uh, Files, I guess in the last release it was called that, uh, is now has, is just been a, relabeled the generic light sources tab, and it has all of Sarit's new components here for modeling electric light in Honeybee, uh, and so this is exactly what we're going to be covering today, and specifically we're going to be using everything to create a, uh, a layer. And Illuminaire just refers to um, all, essentially all, it's a set of lights, I guess is one thing. So you have a Illuminaire zone, which is basically a set of points that define that where, where the lights are. You have an IES file path. Now just to briefly explain what an IES file path, this is essentially what the manufacturer of the lighting fixture gives you. Uh, it contains all of the information, including the bulb, uh, including the lampshade, or including anything that is going to direct the light to a certain area. Uh, a lot of times it also includes some things that might diffuse that electric light in a number of ways. Uh, and so you'll see ARPIT is as distributed to you guys, or will distribute to you, a, um, a large set of files, some two of which are, are an I, IES files. Uh, one that defines our street lights and one that defines our kind of path lights there. Uh, but usually you guys, any, any uh, type of light picture that you specify, you can usually find an IES file path just by Googling and searching for it, uh, searching for the name and typing IES file next to it. Um, so really those, these are the two key things that define essentially a luminaire, an electric lighting picture that we can put into our simulation. Um, all right, so first, all right, let's bring in this IES file path first. So I'm just going to bring up a native grasshopper file path, uh, file path parameter, and select that. And I'm going to right click and set one file path. And you guys will see that there are two, there should be two IES files that RPIN gives to you, uh, as I and as I just mentioned previously. And specifically, I think so. We have. So this is the a high pressure sodium in HPS one, uh, and I believe yes, this is the path light, and then the other one is the street light there, the SAR two uh, one fifty. Um, so all right, so because we're defining the path lights right now, I'm going to select this one, and you see all that that all that this native grasshopper path component does is it just specifies what the path is to that IES file on our system is, and so I'm going to connect up that IES file there. Next thing we need is a luminaire zone, which is essentially defined by our, our points, our path lights that we've already brought in. Um, but there's one other, a few other things that we have to do here, uh, and that specifically we have to pass the points through a Honeybee IES luminaire zone component, which is also on the light sources tab here. Uh, and so this essentially takes the, the points as input, so I'm going to connect up the points there. Uh, and then, really, I'm not going to worry about too many of these other things right now, but uh, essentially these are a whole other set of parameters that help you define where exactly these, these lights are pointing. Um, so, for example, when we get to the next one, we're going to use the aiming point to say that this is where I want that light to point, the street light to point, rather. Um, but because these path lights, they're, they're pretty much just circular, they're just kind of uh, throwing the light kind of all the way around in a circle, we don't really have to aim them. We can take the default of having this, them just aim straight to the ground. 
And then there's also uh, an input here called custom lamp, which just takes uh, the input here. Uh, and that's for sort of, you know, uh, playing with some of the colors, some of the other types, really trying to play around and, and customizing that, that, uh, that IES file that you get. Um, but all right, in any case, I'm going to connect up this, this luminaire zone now to the, the luminaire component. And you'll see it'll no longer be orange now. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of other inputs on this, none of which are really required, uh, but there are a whole bunch of geometry outputs that you can get, like drawing a web that indicates where the light is going to be thrown by the IES file. Um, you, can, uh, you can hook up a custom lamp definition here. Uh, you can hook up a name for it, all these things, or multipliers to, to, uh, to change the illuminance value of those. Uh, but really, I'm just going to take the default right now. I'm not really going to modify this too much. But of course, if you're a lighting designer, you probably want to get into a lot of these things sometimes to really customize it uh, and, and size the light correctly. But I'm just going to set up a, a set of true Boolean to write rad here. And you see that a command window will pop up. That's a radiance function that's running uh, to essentially just turn all these inputs that we put in here, including the IES file and the luminaire zone, into something that radiance understands. And specifically, that, that format that Radiance understands is called the .rad file, uh, which you see is here. And this is what we're going to hook up to the actual uh, uh, Illuminance simulation that we're about to run. Uh, very, very, uh, another few important things that I will just want to show you guys here is that you get SAD outputs a whole bunch of details about the lamp. And this is all information that is pretty much contained in the IES file. Um, so you have things like the lumen of the lamp. Uh, so this is a measure of the light intensity of that source. Uh, it has a uh, set of dimensions that define the length, width, and height of that, uh, or of the, of the way that the light is thrown by the lamp, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that, that sort of define exactly what this is here. So this is just so you guys are aware of what's inside the IES file, that a lot of the work is usually done for you, that you don't have to make you know, the geometry of light diffusers or anything like that, that it's all really contained within the IES file here. All right, so we've done this for our path lights. Let's do the same now. I'm just going to copy paste uh, in order to get something for our street lights. And so as you can guess, maybe we'll set this to false while we make some changes here. So I'm going to hook up the street lights to our point list in our, in our luminaire zone. Uh, I'm going to set one file path so that we're now using the street lights, uh, which is the SAR file here uh, for, in order to represent those street lights. Uh, and then importantly also, I want to make sure because these street lamps, as, you, as you're going to see actually when we run the, the aluminum simulation, that these street lamps have an orientation and we want to make sure that they're kind of oriented longitudinally along the street so we're getting like the best, best throw of light uh, or direction of light onto that street. Uh, and so in order to do this, so we, there's a few ways we can do this. We can actually just change the spin, uh, no sorry, we can change the orientation which is essentially just going to rotate that luminaire into the direction that we want. But especially when we start to have a lot of points like this, uh, it's going to be easiest to just, um, to just set a, make a set of aiming points that, that correspond to the street lights. Uh, and actually, in order to do that, because the order of the points is actually pretty important here. All right, let me, let me actually make things a bit clearer here. Uh, all right, so we have, these are our points where our light is located, and then these are the points where we want to aim the light uh, on the ground here. Um, and, uh, and so essentially what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to reset. I'm going to go set multiple points just so that I can make sure that I really control. Oops, so sorry, if I, what did I do here? So make sure nothing is selected and then set multiple points. And this will allow me to really be clear about the order of the points, so that I can make sure that the order matches uh, between those, uh, those lights that are above here and the aiming points that I want each light to correspond to. So I'm going to hit Enter. And so now I know I've got the right order of points for the street lights. And I'm going to copy paste this point parameter. And maybe we'll just label it for clarity. I'll label it aiming points, aiming uh, uh, whoops. Points, all right. Aiming points, uh, all right. <laughs> all right, so we're going to, I'm just going to right click now. I'm going to say set multiple points. And in that same order, I kind of went, uh, where did I go? I went clockwise. So I'm going to set the aiming points here in the same exact order, just so that I'm sure that each light corresponds with, with its correct aiming point. And I'm going to hit Enter. And now these points are within, uh, within Grasshopper. 
And these can be connected up to, oops, not sorry, not to the orientation, but to the aiming point here. Um, and so you guys may have noticed there was a little bit in the last stable release, there was a slight bug with the aiming points. Uh, if that happens, you can just specify a number of angles.